All right, my name is Greg Mancios. I'm the director of the Murphy Institute for Worker Education and Labor Studies, and it's always my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Institute. Um, we've got a, a very exciting guest and, uh, and topic, uh, an important topic for us to discuss today. Um, uh, we are going to spend about uh, an hour and a half, and we're uh, gonna leave some time for Q&A. Uh, so uh, please uh, join me in <coughs> welcoming our moderator, John Monkoff, who will introduce the topic, and the uh, Reverend Al Sharpton. Thank you. Nice to see you again, sir. First, welcome. This forum is the first of the Institute's monthly public programs taking place during the coming academic year. These events bring together New York regional labor members, scholars, and activists to discuss and debate the pressing issues of our time and our city. And as we will soon see, today we are discussing issues that are, are plenty timely and pressing. You'll find flyers on your chairs for the next forum, which will take place on October 31st, called Jobs and Climate, Two Crises, One Solution. It will build on the momentum coming out of the People's Climate March this Sunday, September 21st, and will feature Bill McKibben, founder and director of 350.org, one of the main forces behind the People's Climate March. 350 is the safe level of carbon dioxide in parts per million in the atmosphere. We're now at 397 ppm and climbing. As most of you know, the Murphy Institute is a wonderful institution. Now in its 31st year, it serves workers and the labor movement by offering BA and MA programs in workforce development, labor studies, and now urban studies. We run a highly successful union semester program each year. Details are available in the material on everyone's seat, and our staff members are around the room for you to talk to uh, and answer questions that you might have after the forum. Finally, this forum also highlights our expanding urban studies program. A great new addition to our faculty is Professor Michael Fortner. Michael, where are you? Can you raise your hand, stand up, thanks. Who is academic director of the urban studies program. We're also planning to introduce a community semester program modeled on the urban semester program and staff members will be happy uh, to talk with you about that as well if you have ideas. Eve Barron, who is the program director for urban studies, is also with us. In a few minutes, we'll hear from Reverend Al Sharpton, one of the few people in our city who genuinely needs no introduction. Before we turn to him, however, I've been asked to share a few thoughts to frame the discussion. And then we'll hear from the Reverend for about half an hour and we'll have a chance for some questions and answers afterwards, and we'll, we'll end uh, promptly about 11.15 or so. In the spring of 1997, for those, many of you, I guess, in the room who can remember back that far, uh, when Ruth Messenger began to campaign to unseat Rudy Giuliani for mayor, as was our speaker today also campaigning, she got strong advice that she raised the subject of the abusive way in which police officers were treating black and Latino young men in New York City. She was reluctant to do so because of the broad support for the zero tolerance crime fighting tactics of Mayor Giuliani and Police Commissioner Howard Safer who had recently succeeded Bill Bratton. She feared that strong advocacy for those who were on the receiving end of abusive treatment would alienate many white voters whose support she would need to win the election. Then, on the night of August 9th, 10th, the police arrested Abner Luima and badly abused him, one could say tortured him, in the station house. Our speaker, Reverend Sharpton, made the outrage about Luima's treatment the centerpiece of his campaign. As a result, Messenger almost failed to make the 40% margin that she needed for the nomination and went on to an historic defeat by Rudy Giuliani and left in the wake of that election was a badly divided Democratic Party that did not come together all its various wings around a winning nominee until 2013. Fast forward to today. Violent crime is at an historic low rate in New York City today. 
From a high of 2,014 murders in 1990, that figure fell to 335 last year in 2013. Violent crime, robbery, assault, and other more common crimes that make people afraid of walking around their neighborhoods have fallen almost as steeply. From over 100,000 in 1990, the number of robberies fell to 19,128 in 2013, even as the city's population grew and became more diverse. This is a wonderful, even miraculous achievement for the city in general, and particularly for those who live in middle and low income black and Latino neighborhoods where violent crimes have historically been most prevalent. It's hard to understate the importance of this achievement, which had many positive ramifications in terms of neighborhood residents feeling freer and more secure in inhabiting their communities, making our city more attractive for people to move here and live here, improving our economy and raising property values. At the same time, we've continued to experience many highly disturbing moments concerning how police interact with those they are policing. And Eric Garner's death is just the most recent of a long series. For me, this raises two basic questions. First, did policing practices have a lot to do with the fall of the violent crime rate in New York City? And second, if so, can the New York City Police Department produce the same positive results without abusing minority young men and violating their civil rights? Our speaker and I would both like the answer to both of these questions to be yes. The evidence from research on the first question is mixed. There may be other reasons besides policing that help drive down the violent crime rate, particularly the waning of the crack epidemic. Yet my own look at the data and my understanding of the Comstat process within the police department convinces me that policing does make a real difference. Specifically, concentrating police resources on the places where the incidence of crime is high, when combined with efforts that get weapons off the street, have, in my view, had a very positive effect. So unlike some of my friends, I do think the answer to the first question is yes even though many other factors clearly are also contributing to the fall of the crime rate. But do the police have to mistreat young black and Hispanic men and be an oppressive force in their neighborhoods to get this result? Which parts of police practices really affect crime rates and should be retained, and which can be and must be stopped or reformed because they mistreat people? Uh, sometimes with very bad outcomes, because, and also because they heighten the alienation that neighborhood residents feel towards the police, thus undermining the trust and cooperation that underlie effective policing. Two final thoughts before we turn to Reverend, Reverend Sharpton. Between Abner Louima and Eric Garner, we had had far too many instances of police mistreatment, or worse. Despite re repeated promises from police commissioners and mayors to retrain beat cops and change street level practices, it is not clear that we have fundamentally changed the ways in which cops interact with people when they are going about their policing. Even now, the number of stop question frisks has fallen sharply from its, low, from its high levels a few years ago, but the number of misdemeanor arrests are, have been rising, perhaps taking the place of the former practices. Um, can we reform daily practice in the NYPD to keep crime low while honoring everyone's civil rights? Do we know exactly what we need to change? And if so, do we know how to put those changes in place? And do we have the political will to do so? A final thought before turning to our speaker. One reason that it is hard to sustain the outrage about police misconduct is that if forced to make a choice, Many New Yorkers, including the city's great black and Hispanic middle class, might choose more aggressive policing and security over return to higher levels of crime with less pressure on young people. As the greatest beneficiaries of the fall of the crime rate, most black and Hispanic voters in New York City are not soft on crime. With these thoughts as a preface, it is my great pleasure to turn the microphone over to the one and only Reverend Al Sharpton, one thing you may not know about him is that the National Action Network, of which he is the founding president, now has f over 40 chapters and affiliates around the country, and he is a national figure as well as a, a great local figure on this topic. 
Reverend Sharp. Thank you. Uh, two, two things I want to uh, elaborate on that was raised in your comments and get into my own and then the Q&A is that uh, one is that it is interesting as he recounted the 97 race with uh, Ruth Messenger, uh, which did divide the Democratic Party around the question of policing and did not come back together until 13 when the Democrats won the city, uh, the first time since 90, uh, since 90, uh, well, since the defeat of 93, I'd say since 89. Uh, and what was interesting is that the, uh, one of the main things that brought the party together to victory in 2013 was another police matter, stop and frisk. And uh, Bill de Blasio, who took a strong uh, position on that, was able to win with that as one of his main themes. I would say pre-K and stop and frisk was his main theme. And he carried the overwhelming majority of black and Latino districts against a black candidate who was a lot more moderate on that image. So it's interesting, uh, I never thought about it, but it's interesting how policing divided the party and policing united the party for victory in, uh, uh, when you look at the 97 race and the uh, 2013 race. And the uh, fact that I was uh, in the center of both is just a, uh, some dessert for the meal. <laughs> Uh, I, let, let me say that uh, it is very interesting as we look at this summer that has been uh, inundated uh, in the media with uh, police cases, many of which I've been involved with. I, in fact, just landed from Cincinnati where last night I was in Beaver Creek uh, where a young man has been killed by police. Uh, who they claimed was uh, banishing a gun at people in a Walmart store. The gun ended up being a BB gun. And uh, I was scheduled to speak at Central State University last night anyway, and I did, which is near Beaver Creek. We dealt with that case. But it was interesting when I received a call, and unlike uh, many of the tabloids that report in the city, National Action Network or I never get involved in cases unless we're called by the victim. Uh, the overall image that we're given is that we run into cases that make big media. The fact is that most of the cases we got involved in, we made the media come. There was no media. Uh, so when I got the call from the uh, Staten Island chair of National Action Network, Cynthia Davis, about Eric Garner, and uh, we responded to it and talked to his mother and then his widow and got involved. We were in the second week of organizing and trying to mobilize support for Eric Garner when I got the call from uh, the father of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. And I'd never heard of Ferguson, had no idea what it was. But uh, when the father, the grandfather, explained to me that his grandson had laid out there four and a half hours, that is what compelled us to go in. And we went in before the violence. And when the violence came, of course, it became a national story because of the militarization. But what was common to me about both situations that I don't think anyone has looked at is both the Garner case and the Michael Brown case in Ferguson, which are probably the most noted of the summer, both of them were policing on low-level crimes. You uh, got to deal with the fact that Eric Gardner, at worst, was accused of selling Lucy cigarettes. And Michael Brown, at worst, was supposed to have taken some cigarellos out of a convenience store. So I think that one of the thing that has, things that has compounded the outrage 
is that not only do you have loss of life and questionable behavior, it's over some cigarellos or some Lucy's. Now, the thing that also leads toward further polarization, in my judgment, is that in both cases, men unarmed are dead. There's no question there's a life extenuating circumstance here because there's no gun here. There's no question, and in all the years that I've been involved, we've had to debate cases where the police said, I thought my life was in danger. There's no question in either case that the policeman's life was in danger. They did not say in Ghana they thought their life was in danger. There's a video that clearly shows there was no threat. And in fact, on the video, we hear Gardner say 11 times, I can't breathe, and the policeman still holds him in the chokehold. With policemen surrounding him, none of which saying, that's against policy, that's illegal, let him go. Nobody stopped him. In the, in the Michael uh, Brown case, there's a question of whether or not there's a struggle for a gun. It is beyond my imagination to see why if a kid had taken some cigarellos out of a convenience store, which at worst would have been a summons, that he would say, let's go for an A misdemeanor and grab a cop's gun and shoot him. I, I just don't understand the logic of that. But that's the policeman's alleged story. But even then, after he didn't get the gun, gun goes off and shoots him. They say that he then lunges at a cop that now has a gun and the cop shoots him six times. Doesn't make sense. Seven witnesses, including two construction workers who are white, say that didn't happen. But my point is that all of this is around aggressive policing of low-level crime. None of these killings, either one of these two, are around apprehending a gun or anything of danger from someone. This is on low-level policing. And I think that part of what we have raised is that we cannot have aggressive policing that is targeting. Now, I, I, I heard, as the professor outlined about the uh, level of crime going down, and it was mixed, and he would lean to yes. But part of what I would enter into that discussion is that we recently saw, even I think it was the Daily News exposed, that even in areas where it is majority white, the majority of the people stopped and summons the black. So it is not even just areas where the crime uh, is most concentrated. On the Upper East Side, where blacks and Latinos are in single digits of the population, they're the majority of the people stopped in summons. So it's not targeted by areas. And what we've been saying to the NYPD is that the unsaid underlying problem is racial profiling. And I agree with him wholeheartedly that the beneficiaries of having crime stopped is blacks and Latinos who suffer from it most. But we also cannot be subjected to being profiled as the price we must pay to keep crime down. There must be, and I would argue there is ways that you can keep crime down and have the cooperation of the community without saying that the price you pay for keeping crime down is you check your civil liberties in at the door and also subject yourself to a racially profiling police department. The thing that is very interesting to me is that with all of the circumstances that we've seen, black community, Latino community leaders, including me, have rallied around gun control. I've done gun back programs with Ray Kelly. We've done a lot of things with uh, both the Bloomberg and the Blasio administration. Uh, Giuliani and I were not on speaking terms, but <laughs> his successors 
all of us worked around crime. We've said that people that are wrong in our community need to be removed because they are victimizing us. But I think one of the things that adds to the polarization in the city is there is not one case where a policeman has been accused of a crime that the police unions in this city say we don't support the cop. Every case, they will say the policeman is right, even if we say the community is not with the criminal. Every case, they demonize us for questioning the cop. And we become the polarizers. Now, the facts don't even matter. Most people don't know. I don't think we had a larger movement other than Diallo and Luima than we had around Sean Bell. And two of the three cops we marched on were black. But I was still called a racist. They were black cops that killed Sean Bell. And the defense in court of uh, one of the defense attorneys was, Sean Bell was a bad black. My cop was a good black. But we're racist. And the language and the vehemence of the police unions who I think I, I respect has to support their members. But I think if the media was fair, they would be saying, wait a minute. One, they can't be racist. And second, do you ever think a policeman is ever wrong? Just take this summer. We had a lady beat unarmed on the freeway in Los Angeles on video. We have Michael Brown. We have the Beaver Creek case with the man in the, uh, in the Walmart store with the BB gun. We have Eric Garner. We have another case just last night in Savannah, Georgia. All of these cases are automatically the police is right. And if we dare raise a question, mind you, all we said in, in all of these cases is we want the federal government to come in and investigate. Oh, they're polarizing. They're anti-police. It's going to lead to anarchy. I think that the one of the definitions or one of the ways that you get to a police state is when you cannot question policing. And I think that we have become dangerously close in some quarters, clearly not all and not the majority, but in some quarters of this city, we've gotten dangerously close to a police state mentality when you're not allowed to question anything. It does not take a left-winger or a radical to question why a man begging that he can't breathe is dead. Any human being would question, wait a minute, why didn't you stop choking him? And I think that if we're going to find a mid-ground in how we deal with low-level crime and policing of low-level crime, we at least must start with the boundaries of there is wrong on both sides. And those that are wrong on both sides should be held accountable. One of the reasons that we have always raised the question of going outside of local prosecutors is because local prosecutors function hand in glove with local police. And in order to establish a case, you ask local police to help turn on their fellow local policemen. And usually that puts the appearance, if not in fact, the uh, actuality of a conflict of interest. When you step outside of that with the federal government, there is the local prosecutor does not use federal government agents or FBI to gather their evidence and you get more of an objective uh, review or at least the appearances of some. And we've been successful. The most noted is Rodney King in California, Simi Valley acquitted, got into federal court and won, and right here locally, Abner Lewimba, where the local district attorney stepped aside and we successfully saw prosecution of police there. So one of the reasons that that is, asked to, is, is done because in many ways, we think it protects the prosecutor because the prosecutor then is not depending upon a conflicted local police 
to deal with having to turn on, in their minds, their own uh, uh, allies or our own colleagues in the police department. I think that we must find a mid-ground between how we protect people, particularly from guns and violent crimes, and how we protect people's rights. Uh, I think that the initial uh, movements toward community policing showed great promise. I think that we are at a very interesting point now where we've seen a reduction, a serious reduction in stop and frisk. And I think that as we now continue this debate on broken windows, that if community groups, civil liberty groups, NYPD, can come together and form a policing program that both satisfies the continued reduction and maintenance of that reduction of crime, but at the same time, not at the expense of civil liberties. We're at an opportune time, both in terms of city policy and in where the data is, to try to formulate that program. But in order to do that, I think all must come to the table feeling that all things are equal and accountable. That is why I said what I said at the City Hall Roundtable, that the answer is not first training. The answer is when we know that police will be held accountable. And all the training in the world will not matter until police see one of their own prick walk for breaking the law. Now, they of course went front page and said I was being, uh, I was lecturing the police commission. It was, it was interesting to me. They invite me to City Hall. We have a meeting. The mayor walks me in, seats me at the front of the table, and then the tabloid wants to know why I was sitting at the front of the table where the mayor sat me and why I addressed the commissioner about a case that the family had asked me to represent them. The absurdity of tabloid media in New York is just crazy. As, as he said, Right now, uh, you might remember just four months ago, the President of the United States came to New York to speak at our convention. So I'm not exactly overwhelmed with going to City Hall anymore. <laughs> and what, what I asked the uh, media was, well, let me ask you something. If the meeting was about Staten Island, and I have been asked by the Gardner family to represent them, where would you suggest I have sat? in the back of the room, I mean, where was I? And first of all, given what we do every day, what would make you think that my, I was just waiting with bated breath to go to City Hall and sit with the mayor or the police commissioner about anything other than my concern for the case? But it's, you know, a, a lot of the media in New York just has not caught up with 2014. I think they're still back in 1988, not only with me, but with the whole perspective of the city. The reality is that I think we have a great opportunity under this administration, given these crime statistics, to create a mid-ground, a coming together of policy that could keep crime down and protect people's civil liberties and deal with racial profiling if we are willing to hold all sides accountable. I think the Garnet case is going to be very critical in that because I do not think you can sell to many of us that a man on videotape begging for his life should have died. And if there is any meaning to a policy of illegal chokehold, if nothing else, the officer has to deal with that. And to act unwilling to do that, I think, would poison a discussion of fairness around policing in the city. Again, I underscore, we're talking about he was selling Lucy's at his worst. His friend's saying he wasn't even selling that day. I'm saying stipulate, give them the Lucy's. Are you telling me now that we're going to choke folk to death for selling Lucy's? And that we're divisive to question that? That is certainly not a city to me that any of us want to see happen. So my, my position 
clearly is. Yes, I think that we're pregnant with opportunity. I hope we do not uh, blow the opportunity at this point. I also think that, uh, that one of the most explosive issues in the country has always been policing. And I think that New York has been fortunate that it has a viable movement uh, in labor and in civil rights so that we've not had these explosions. But if you look at Watts, South Central, all of the major explosions, Rodney King, they were usually around policing. It's interesting. People don't explode over poverty. And I'm not suggesting they do. If anyone's here from the Post, I'm not advocating <laughs> any explosions. <laughs> but I think the reason you see the reaction around policing is that when people feel they cannot trust those that they have been given the, the safety of their family, they lose it. When they feel they're under siege by those that they feel that are there to protect them, they become most desperate. And I think because people in New York have had ways to express their outrage, that we've not had a lot of that here. And I think that that is a good thing for all. One, because I think any violence is wrong. But second, I think that it, in many ways, obscures the real reasons for the protest. When I was in uh, Ferguson, I told the young people that had engaged in some of the violence that even though I understand your anger, not only don't I agree with violence, you are hurting the case. Because the defense of the policeman that killed Michael Brown is that Michael Brown was a violent, out of control young man. And every time you act violent and out of control, they can therefore transfer that to Michael Brown and win this case. So not only do I have moral problems with it, I have strategic problems with you becoming exactly what the opposition wants to project the deceased as. Thankfully, that has not happened in New York. It is interesting, of course, you uh, all, I'm sure, read it in all of the tabloids that the same week we saw two or three nights of explosive violence in Ferguson, we marched over 10,000 people in New York and Staten Island and not one, one window was broken. And I'm sure you'll see all the front pages praising us for that. <laughs> I think sometimes if we were a little more balanced and fair in our analysis, we could go along longer way in these discussions. So my bottom line is we need accountability on all sides. We need to use this opportunity to try and create policy that will satisfy civil liberties and crime. And we need to start saying that all police are not born with perfection and above being questioned. Because where we cannot be ruled by a mob that says the police are wrong, we cannot move toward a police state where you cannot, under any circumstances, question police. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are a lot of questions on your mind. When you rise to ask your question, uh, please tell us who you are, and um, I understand sometimes it's impossible not to, not to uh, give a little speech, but let's try to keep our, our questions uh, as scripts and to the point as possible. Uh, so, yes, sir, please stand. Uh, morning, everyone. Morning. morning. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Kazembe Batts. I'm a student here at uh, the Graduate Center in Urban Studies. And actually, I, I know Rev. I used to be his field organizer many years ago. Uh, what would you say about the common practice nowadays of not identifying who the cops are when they are involved with murders across the country, and also the fact that there's the lack of arrests? You know, the cops aren't even arrested uh, in Ferguson or in Staten Island to this point. 
I, you know, th this is something that uh, is quite disturbing to me, both protecting the identity of the policeman. It was around two weeks before they identified Darren Wilson in Ferguson. And uh, I do not understand the reason a public servant that has been accused of a crime uh, must be uh, some secret. I mean, I don't even understand the, the rationale behind that. And, uh, but even more so is uh, when you look at the fact that you almost are now in a zone where the only time they arrest a policeman is if there's an indictment, which does not happen with any other citizen. If there is alleged crime and there's probable cause, the citizen is arrested and we wait to see if a grand jury indicts him. With a policeman, we wait on a grand jury, and that's true of Ferguson, that's true of, of, uh, uh, of, of, of Eric Gardner here in Staten Island. And what I'm raising is, then fine, if that is the case, then let's create a law that says that police are immune to arrest until there's a grand jury. Now, the problem with that law is, are they immune from all arrests? So if they're involved in domestic violence, you can't arrest them without a grand jury? Or if they break in a store, you can't arrest them? Or is it only if they shoot unarmed people <laughs> that they are not arrested? So I mean, maybe the reason they don't have the law is because they don't really want that debate. But either probable cause applies. If, if I did a crime in this room right now, police came see a crime and I'm the culprit, they would arrest me. Then they would later decide if a grand jury is gonna indict me. Why is it different laws for police? And if we're gonna have the different laws, then how do we define what they're immune for and what they are not immune for? I think it's an interesting question. Yes, in back. Uh, John Casey from Baruch College. Uh, CPR, courtesy, professionalism, respect. It's already emblazoned on the side of every police car in New York City. So obviously they've been struggling with it up till now. I mean, how would you suggest that they operationalize what had been an aspiration or has been an aspiration for <laughs> quite a number of years? I think that a lot of it is in the culture of uh, policing, which is why I said to Commissioner Bratton, and I'll continue to say, until police know that there is a seriousness about police that go over the line and see some prosecute, you will not change the culture. They think it's all talk. The last six years of uh, Ray Kelly's uh, tenure, he would have the graduating class of the NYPD convene at the Apollo Theater in Harlem, 1,500 of them. He would have people like me and Reverend Herbert Daughtry come and speak every year. They, we make speeches, we talk about our objections and what they should and shouldn't be doing. And they would talk about what you said, the, the uh, slogans on the side of the car. But if the culture is that we can do what we want and nobody's gonna do anything about it, and we're gonna be supported no matter what, you can have all of the slogans you want. People need to know and the that they're gonna have to pay for crimes, even if they're policemen, and the reverse is true. In our community, if people feel that you can get away with crimes and nobody's gonna quote snitch on you, then you are going to see people continue to gang bang and crime. It works on both sides of this. Could I follow up? What exact, what specific accountability mechanisms would, would make you happy to see <clears throat> put in place by the new administration and and the uh, police commissioner. I I I would have liked. Uh, well, one I'd like to see the prosecutors start operating uh, uh, differently. But in terms of the city, I think when you have an obvious police uh, misconduct, there must be dramatic ways. If I was the commissioner, when a policeman on tape engaged in a chokehold with eleven police for my life. I would have walked in the precinct and took his badge and fired him, no matter what the prosecutor did. And I think it would have sent a sick. This is a clear violation of police policy 
no matter what the finding is by the criminal court, clearly this was a chokehold that the commissioner said was a chokehold. And clearly this man begged for his life. I think there must be a dramatic way that this administration says they will not tolerate certain behavior by police. In, on this side and back, why don't we take a few, the, the few questions that people have raised their hands and we can answer them all at once. Yes, sir. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Len Leslie. I'm a retired police officer. Uh, I'd like to, well, uh, first of all, we know the chokehold is illegal. And I'm sure Reverend Sharpen is uh, familiar with the case out in New Mexico where the state trooper was shot at the moving vehicle for speed. Some area right. he was fired. I'd like to get your thoughts with regard to, you know, now, because that was on tape, the personal um, videotape that they want the cops to wear now. Just if you could speak to that. Okay. Uh, videotaping interactions. The other person back there and then down here, and then we'll let the Reverend respond. Good morning, Reverend Sharpton. Uh, my name is Donla Huffman. I am an MA student here at the Murphy Institute. My question is, as a father, what can I do in my community to help bridge this gap with our local police to say that I want effective policing, but I don't want to be killed or, or harassed uh, for something that I didn't do? What, what, what do you say to that? Would it be helpful for the police to set up a standard operating procedure that where in any case where there's a direct confrontation, physical force is used, someone is injured, uh, that a police officer has to go through certain steps. Take the stigma off signaling out an individual officer in a particular case, but every time it happens, there's a special prosecutor, a special attorney, a standing grand jury, because I mean, look, this, we all have like all these decades of experience with Civilian Complaint Review Board and frankly, you know, it's, it's a, a road to nowhere. It doesn't help anybody. Uh, so I, could we begin to demand of this administration that there be a new standard operating procedure wherever there's physical confrontation? Okay, take one. Good morning, I'm Giovanni Suriel. I'm uh, an advisor at Gutman Community College. My question is, while we wait for police to be accountable or we wait for administration to pass, what form of education do we take at the expense of our mental health? And meaning, do we educate our young men of color to be um, subjected to feeling like they're doing something wrong when they're being unnecessarily questioned or wrongfully questioned by the police? Or do we advocate for our young men of color to kind of not speak back in a disrespectful way, but like inquire and ask these questions because you notice the polarization of when someone asks a question, they're wrong. So at what point do we ask questions and you know inquire about our civil rights or sacrifice our mental health and pretty much demonize ourselves in interacting with the police because that's the feeling that they tend to give us. Thank you. All right, uh, one, I do support cameras on police. I think that it's a step in the right direction uh, that if, uh, you have the cameras on police uniform. I think it, not only will it possibly document encounters, I think it, it uh, tends to make police understand that they're under scrutiny. So I, I, I don't think it is a answer all, but I think it is certainly a step toward uh, uh, having a more, uh, a, a better form of policing because scrutiny is there or the potential scrutiny is there. In, in terms of uh, uh, the second question about how you can keep crime down as a parent, but at the same time you don't want to be killed, I think that's where we've got to get back into community policing. We've got to have these local precincts engaged with the community where we work out precinct by precinct ways that police and community interact. Uh, our headquarters on 145th Street uh, in Harlem, uh, we did a thing called Occupy the Corner because there were so many guns, we ended up working with the local precinct. But we also need to be able to work with them when there are questions about policing. And I think that's what I'm trying to recommend this administration does. And it comes to Ed Ott's suggestion. I think that that may be 
something very much that we need, an outside, standalone part that would catch all cases, whether they're proven to be right or wrong, that a, a violent encounter is there, that people can have the confidence that it is not something that's going to be conflicted, that specializes in this, and that police know that it will go there if there's a violent encounter. And I think that that is exactly uh, the kinds of things that we've proposed both federally to um, Attorney General Eric Holder. And, and uh, on the last one, I, I, I tend to, uh, you know, it's, it's a hard question. Do you tell young people to not uh, question because you could be harassed or you could be accosted? But if you do, you're sacrificing your own self-esteem and mental health. I, I tend to be uh, the ones that say don't sacrifice your mental health, stand up and take the risk. But again, you have to deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. But it would be very difficult for me to tell a young person just to get by, shut up about your civil liberties. It's just very difficult for me to do that. that, that this is raises a really you know, fundamental question about how police interact with people that they're trying to stop doing something or bow down to them or whatever. I mean, I've had plenty of interactions with, with cops in which, you know, I've seen them do something and I've said, you know, uh, why are you doing that? Or, you know, and they turn on me like, you say one more word and you're going to be in handcuffs. And so it's, it's not just, you know, young minority men. It's that that police officers want to think of themselves as the absolute controller of these public environments, and they're not going to take anything from no. anyone. And I'm not, I'm not sure how, how it's possible to really change that, that mindset. It seems very pervasive in, 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 in police. Well, it is a mindset. And, I, and again, that, that speaks to the culture. And I think you've got to change it. Maybe if we get these cameras on policing, maybe that can change it. Uh, or somewhat because they will be on film acting that way. Because I do not think that uh, enforcing the law and rudeness is the same thing. And, and some of them are just unnecessarily rude. Reverend Sharpton, T. Y. Chang from Fox 5, just a quick question. The, in the last 40 years, it, there's been a historical pattern with the New York City Police Department of corruption. So 40 years ago, we had the Knapp Commission, 20 years later, the Modeling Commission has now been 21 years later. Do you think it's time for a new commission to investigate corruption in the New York City Police Department? Well, I think uh, it, is, it is absolutely uh, time. I think that when you look at uh, how there it seems to be certain areas that uh, police has not concentrated on and other areas they have been overindulgent, you'd have to ask yourself why. And I think that uh, when we've seen uh, various levels of corruption in terms of public service, uh, why would we not come in now and deal with policing? So I think that uh, it is absolutely time to investigate corruption in policing. And I think that all of the police unions in the city ought to know that T.Y. Chong advocated it, not Al Sharpton. <laughs> Didn't quite hear you. Will you make that suggestion to Mayor de Blasio? I will communicate your suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> the lady in the red hat, and then in back, and then down in front. My name is Vivian. I'm just an advocate. Um, Professor Molenkoff, back to people's, um, young people being stopped by the police, OK? Has any of your relatives ever been driving in a regular good-looking car, but they happen to be black? I think the police is supposed to say, may I see your license or registration, please? Most times in our community, the question is, whose car is this? Okay, so we're just trying to show you, what do you tell your young, already he's already being disrespected. There is no APB saying the car has been stolen. And why would you ask somebody that question? And then we had relatives who went to their graduates from, from um, Dartmouth, went down to Tennessee to be best men at their friend's wedding. Both occasions, we as parents said to them, 
please, no baseball caps, no hoodies, stick to your, stick to the, um, the, the, speed, the speed limit twice. Troopers stop them over the first time they're in regular clothes. Uh, we don't see you, um, them there kind, you them kind down here. This is the disrespect. He looks in, they're doing nothing, he still pulls them over. Conversely now, the day of the wedding, they're all in their tops, beautifully attired, handsome young men, Hispanic and black, still pulled over by the trooper. The same question. What are you, we now don't see your kind down here. To me again, is a disrespect. They did absolutely nothing. So now when you, the, their feelings are hurt, this is what we need to, how do we address our young men? I don't think they should have answered back. We told them, say nothing, just listen. If he asks you for your registration, say, may I open my, my um, dashboard? Because you, that sudden movement, this is what our young people of color, I am telling people who have children between, 70, between 12 and 30, this is what we saw, and it is a matter of policing, it's disrespect. We, we hear you on that, and back. <coughs> My name is Linda Sarsour, I'm the Executive Director at the Arab American Association of New York, and I, I have a question, hi John. Uh, and hi, Rev. Al. Uh, my question is, I mean, you talked about body cameras, and I do think that's a very small step in the right direction, but what we've seen video after video across the country is that police officers continue to be emboldened even when, you know, people that are witnesses are, you know, just in the case of Eric Garner, I mean, they were on video camera. We just saw police officers rough up people in my neighborhood in Sunset Park just this past weekend. So I'm not sure if body cameras necessarily are the answer because I don't feel like cops even care if they're on camera because their lack of accountability in place. And the, and the second part of that is why now? What, what, do you think, what do you think is the difference now, 2014? Police brutality has been happening in our country for like centuries, right? So why now? Like why do, we, I'm not feeling optimistic and I wanna see where the optimism is coming from. Why do we think things are gonna change now? Like what do you see now that you didn't see 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago? Because I don't see that. So I'm just wondering what you see. I, I, I agree with her that uh, uh, it's a step in the right direction, a small step. Uh, but again, it's a small step. And I agree that we've seen uh, police not care, even on video, which is why I repeat what I said to Commissioner Bratt. Until you see accountability, until police see that they are going to be busted for it, I don't think you're going to break the culture. Uh, why do I think that we, uh, why am I more optimistic? I don't know that optimism would be what I'm, uh, uh, would describe my feeling. I think that it is more promising than it was because I think that if we can get a change, we can get it under this political climate than the one we had 20 years ago. Now, I'm not saying we will. But I'm saying that if under Obama and uh, de Blasio we can't get change, then I don't know if we'll ever get change. Uh, you've got to remember, 20 years ago, we were under Bush and Giuliani. So if I seem like I have a little more hope <laughs> under Obama and de Blasio than I had under Bush Giuliani, that's it. Now, that does not mean that I cannot be disappointed. And that does not mean that we cannot put their feet to the fire, which I tried to do at that round table. But I think the politics has changed, not only because they are considered more progressive, but both of them took on this issue. And if they're just loyal to what they said when they were running, de Blasio about stopping frisk, you must remember President Obama's legislation as a state senator in Illinois was on racial profiling. Uh, Eric uh, uh, Holder, has fought these cases. If they are consistent with what they've said, we will see change. If they're not, then we have to expose that, and we'd be even more disappointed than those that were adversarial. Question here and there, and, and, and Arthur, and then we'll go to the others. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kenya Lee, and I'm from the New York City Department of Probation, but um, I want to ask this question on behalf of myself. I want to circle back around to a question the professor asked the reverend. I thought it was very interesting when you asked um, 
what would make the Reverend happy in terms of addressing community policing. And I wanted to rephrase that because while I actually appreciate a lot of the things the Reverend said and that you always say, I'm less interested in what would make you or the community happy. I'm interested in effectiveness. And so maybe holding police accountable is a good thing to do, but I'm wondering where can we look nationally, and if not nationally, internationally, of how police are dealing with these very complicated instances of policing communities where there's violent instances, and how can we, as a community, move to making arguments that are validated by studies of community policing and validated by science so that our argument can be more strengthened, even though we're saying common sense things, but things that we can say, this is happening, like, just to belabor the point, we can look in the private sector and say there's quality assurance. We know that when someone's held accountable, that things move better. But where can we look at that sort of kind of thing internationally and make the same argument um, in our community policing? Uh, good morning, my name is Nick Powers, uh, professor at SUNY Old Westbury, thank you very much. Um, your point about the tabloids in New York being stuck in a 1988 vision of the city I think is very accurate. And implicit in that storyline is that the untouchable status of the police is connected to the public fear of black men and Latino men. And my question is, what new narrative has to emerge of the city that can offer reprieve and a new space for men of color without having targets on our backs since we're born? Arthur Chelliotis, I'm uh, Chairman of the Labor Advisory Board here and uh, President of CWA Local 1180. During the uh, height of the stop and frisk uh, agenda that was going on in this city, uh, certainly my members were telling their sons to go someplace, leave the city. And it occurred to me, and I wonder if there has been any research, that looks at the whole connection between the gentrification of neighborhoods throughout the city and stop and frisk as a way of facilitating the uh, investments made by banks and developers to in fact drive minority, uh, minorities out of our city to make room for the rich. Uh, and has there, has there been any analysis of that? Uh, in terms of the first question, uh, I do know that there is a study that is going on right now uh, <clears throat> by the Department of Justice with the NAACP and NAND, we're involved, on uh, looking at uh, several cities where they claim that it is more effective. I cannot uh, give you the results because I do not have them yet. Uh, but you are absolutely on target that we're looking for where this balance has worked and use it as a national model, which was one of the reasons we wanted to push the Justice Department and, and, and uh, Attorney General Holder to finally deal with one of these. And I commend him that he did go into Ferguson and symbolically say that, but now your point, what is going to effectively do it? So the answer is that it is being looked at and we hope that we'll come up with what is effective, because I think you're right, it's not about our making uh, each other feel better. We need new policies and laws that will govern, uh, because if we just go through a feel good thing, after a minute we'll go back to something else and we won't feel good anymore and you can't govern like that. Uh, in terms of the narrative, in terms of black young men having a target on their back, part of the problem, which we don't talk a lot about in New York, is that uh, the people that control the narrative have not advanced in this city. The, the media in this city is, the, is like the Rocky Mountains. The higher up you get, the whiter it is. I mean, look at who tells the narratives in this city. They are not, there are any number of, of publications and broadcasting outlets that do not reflect at all the demographics of the city. So these are people that look at these stories with their own biases. I'll give you an interesting story. I was on my way yesterday to Cincinnati for this speaking engagement, and a lady stopped me who appeared to be middle-aged and was white, and she said that, uh, I watch your show on MSNBC uh, every night. You're probably the most interesting of the black hosts at night. 
I said, I'm the only black host at night. <laughs> the irony, when people started asking, why is Al Sharpton having a show? The irony is why I'm the only black. Or after six o'clock on cable, that has their own show. But that's the unsaid thing, and I think, and, and that's nationally. I'm talking about in New York. If you went through the editorial rooms, you'd be shocked. So if you see people that are the ones that run the narrative, you can understand why the narrative is so distorted. And I think that that's part of the problem, something that we don't address. It's hard to address it because you argue with the people that have to cover the story that you want addressed. But that's part of the problem. So, uh, you know, I always say, uh, and, and, and I read a lot of John's writings, but, but I always say that what's interesting to me, Ed, is that if you are a minister in New York and you agreed with certain administrations, the newspapers would almost tell people what to think of what you're saying. Uh, and they would say the influential Reverend so-and-so said so-and-so. But I ran for president, may I got good votes, but I'm always the controversial Reverend Al Sharpton. I was almost like we're warning you now in case you didn't know. <laughs> so who decides who's controversial and who's influential? But that is the problem, is, is who we look at the city through the prism of a very narrow demographic. And that demographic is who dominates the media in this town, which goes in, into, uh, uh, I think your point, uh, in, in many ways, I, I think that we, we have got to really examine whether or not some of this is driven by gentrification. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'll quote a friend of mine, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean that there's nobody following me. <laughs> I think that part of what makes people conducive toward leaving areas is when they're harassed. And when you see a public policy of harassment and gentrification at the same time, whether it was intentional or not, one feeds the other. And I think that people are harassed and want to leave. And then you see the turning around of the communities. And the reason why you have to believe that it is, even if it didn't start as a conspiracy, it ends up feeding one another, is that a lot of the harassment went down as the neighborhood changed and as businesses came into being. It amazes me in communities that just five years ago, we couldn't walk down the street, they are now sitting out in the street with cafes drinking mint tulips. It's amazing to me. And I think that you've got to ask yourself why. Are you thinking about peaches in bed <laughs> <laughs> It's a nice place. It is. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I'm Merle Ratner from um, International Commission for Labor Rights and Left Strategies. I want to speak to what the sister here had raised, Linda, I believe. And also, Reverend Sharpton, this is for everybody, actually, there's two speakers and everybody. I heard you say in Reverend, uh, Reverend Sharpton in Ferguson that, you know, now we need to take this, that rage, the anger, and organize. And I, this is a, not a new situation. It's gone back, as, as the sister here said, for decades and decades. And it is connected to systemic issues. It's, it's training of the police and policy, but it's also the underlying racism and white supremacy, the poverty, the inequality, the gentrification. So how do we go to build this into a movement that deals with not only the symptoms and the training of the police, but the underlying causes of this? How do we take the anger and rage and turn it into productive, ongoing organizing that builds a real movement that holds uh, mayors, governors, presidents accountable and builds uh, a real base of power for equality, against racism, for labor rights, and all of these things that are so tied together. How do we take this at this period and make it different so it's not, you know, we go on marches and marches and marches and then the next thing happens and we're with you on every march, but how do we build this into a strong movement that doesn't go away and that continues to build strength? There was another question in back, I think. I'm going to hit a few more reform things. I'm a, I'm a retired UFT teacher. I taught at Martin Luther King for a number of years. I have a son who's 28 and has been stopped and frisked 
and he, he is not white, and it was in Harlem. Anyway, uh, for me, the question is, you were saying the stats have gone down on the stop and frisk. How do they verify those stats? Because do the cops report every time they stop and frisk somebody? The cameras may help, but right now, how do we really verify that? Because it's still going on as far as I can tell, at least a fair amount. That's the one. The other one is on that citizens review board, when they take money and give it to citizens, you know, for, for police brutality or whatever, does that money come out of the specific police precinct where the abuse occurred? Or, you know, are they in any way accountable financially in their department for any, uh, you know, abuse in their precinct? And a, a third question down in front here. I'm sorry, I keep okay. skipping you, but I'll get back to you uh, here. So hello, my name is Colleen Fonseca, and I'm an undergraduate at St. John's University um, with NAACP. Um, so my question is, um, obviously, Reverend Sharpton, and we talk about um, you a lot on campus, um, the students. Um, so our, a big question that we have on campus is, when you envision effective policies to combat police brutality, what role do young people of color have in pushing this forward? Okay, l let me go to the first one, how we sustain a movement. I think that the only way to sustain a movement is you must have permanent structures that keep moving and keep going forward where you affect putting people that come like-minded in office, like a uh, Jermani Williams is one, like a uh, hopefully Bill de Blasio will maintain. I think that when, when I look at, I, I was talking to some young people in Louisiana the, the other night, when I look at the history of civil rights movement, Segregation was there since slavery. It took the Rosa Parks arrest to spark dealing with it. But there was already a movement against segregation. And it took from 55, the Montgomery bus boycott, to 64 to get the law against it. So I think a lot of what we have to do in our movements, and I do this in National Action Network, is teach young people to take the romance out of movements. Be not, Martin Luther King and that movement didn't happen overnight. It took nine years to get a Civil Rights Act. And they kept fighting, and even then they just won public accommodations. They didn't address white supremacy. Those people still felt they were supremacists. They just had to sit in the bus next to people. So we need to be in, 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 in our teachings an evolutionary process. One of the things we do is we meet every Saturday for 23 years. National Action Network has been on the air every Saturday morning, several hundred people uh, at our headquarters and all, because you have to keep it going. So people think we just call a rally when something happens. We have a rally every Saturday morning. And <laughs> if you sustain permanent institutions like Ed and Labor and them can tell you, then you can continue the educating. But if you don't, I think you just end up going from incident to incident. And I think that if you have permanent structures, you can bring about permanent change because you start out of those structures, producing the elected officials and the policy makers that can address these things. But none of it's gonna be a magic wand. Uh, in terms of uh, how they collect the data on stop and frisk, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think that it is questionable, but I'm going by what they have released as data saying is going down, but we still get a lot of complaints, not as much but we still get a lot of complaints about stopping first. So I don't disagree with you. And in terms of young people's roles, I think young people have got to be the ones to lead the movements of reform. That we need younger people that are involved in running for office, registering people in these policy uh, discussions. Young people, the students on campus cannot become uh, uh, just campus activists. They must get into the community. And I think that uh, one of the things that I always have, have uh, said is that if you're not in the community, it does not really lead to change. And a lot of uh, uh, people are classroom activists and are not activists in the community. Like I say to a lot of my colleagues at MSNBC, don't be studio activists. Get out in the real world. And I think that that's what I would challenge young people. Some, take this person and then several in back, or three in back. 
Hi, I'm Sarah Hughes. I run the Union Semester Program here at the Murphy Institute. My students probably have to go to class soon, but we're here. Uh, my question is, given the militarization, um, that's kind of been a thrown around term lately, um, given the NYPD's connection to homeland security, surveillance of Muslim communities, given the facts that, um, that the military is literally providing tanks to local police forces, is it possible to have a reform here at the New York City level um, to change these sorts of policies? And, and given the lack of accountability for, for military when these sorts of things happen, um, you know, is having a local movement enough? Is there always going to be a pressure from a larger national military homeland security, um, you know, f that I think undergirds these things? Some questions in back too. Maybe work our way back from that person to the to the rear. That person? Okay. Hello, thanks for speaking. My name is Emily Eklund. I'm in the Murphy Institute doing the union semester thing. Um, my question is that um, is around what you said about talking in Ferguson to to young people and talking about like strategic limitations to expressing rage and anger and hurt through um, violent and reckless means, but I was kind of wondering like how do you, how do you validate as like a leader, c or how do, how do people like validate those feelings and without just being like strategically doesn't, you know, we shouldn't express them in certain ways, but like if hopefully that's clear. The gentleman right in the blue shirt right behind you is the, the last, qu the, the Reverend has to leave at 11.15, so we'll, after this question and this response, uh, we'll see if we have any time left. Maybe not, but, but maybe. Uh, Reverend less. Sharpton, thank you for speaking to us this morning. I have a question about the labor unions. What are your expectations for what labor unions should be doing to uh, activate their members and educate their members uh, in the struggles that you've outlined. And secondly, uh, how, what initiatives do you uh, want progressives in the unions to undertake uh, to broaden the base of support for changing our situation, which as you've said, is veering in the direction of a police state? <clears throat> All right, uh, first with the militarization question, I think that she raises something that is very, very, uh, true that has not been discussed enough, uh, that New York, given its strategic uh, 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 location and, and, and where we are strategically, is different than a Ferguson, Missouri, in terms of homeland security and all, which is why I think you have to have the federal government in these discussions around how we reform, because you can make all kinds of decisions and then they're superseded and overruled in the name of homeland security. This whole practice of Islamophobia that has gone and continues to go on. Uh, clearly, the federal government has to be in these discussions to deal with how we reform that with local police. And so I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I think what, what really shocked the nation is seeing people in the heartland uh, so militarized. I mean. If we knew they had tanks and things like that in New York, you could rationalize that. But in Ferguson, Missouri? Uh, so, I mean, I think that's what shocked people. But the shock is what now has brought the veil off of everyone. So I think we've got to have these uh, open realignments of how we deal with these questions of, of security, homeland security, and, uh, and, and what is within the realms of what is natural uh, boundaries and what is something fabricated uh, based on bias and, and racism. In terms of her question on uh, people expressing their rage and recklessness, I think that you, I, I'm, I'm not one that tells people don't be outraged. I'm saying that if you really are going to uh, seek change, then you channel your outrage to seek change, or you're being self-indulgent just to explode or implode. The, the problem that we have in, in NAN, in, in our organization, is that we usually represent the victims. So we don't have the luxury 
of just operating based on our emotion because I've got to go back to that family and say, we got a prosecution or not. We've got this or not. Where somebody that just runs out in the street mad, they don't have to answer to a family. Michael Brown's family trust the attorneys and Nan to help them get justice. So they could care less if we went down the street and burned down a store. What does that have to do with them getting justice for their son's death? That is what I think you raise to people. Do you care about the victims or you, do you care about venting your emotions? If you care about venting your emotions, which is a legitimate emotion, know that the people down the other side could care less about how mad you are. They really don't care and will use your anger against you if you're not strategic. And I think that's what we have to say uh, to that. The young lady that talked about there are a lot of uh, cases and, and mentioned a uh, situation with herself, she's absolutely right. We have uh, officers all over the city and around the country. We can't take enough, and we don't get public funding. We can't take en enough calls. And, and the thing that gets to me is people talk about the cases we do with the media attention. You should look at the cases that we don't do and that there are no places to send people. And I think that that is something that, that uh, is, is, is an untold story. I'd like sometime, maybe I'll do it, to, uh, for people to show the amount of people that just on everyday basis have problems that are not facilitated in any way. In terms of labor unions, I think that one of the strengths in the uh, civil rights movement and the anti-war movement uh, and, and in many of the movements over the last half century has been when labor and civil rights and peace groups were together. Labor plays a vital part because their members are the direct frontline people that suffer from all of these maladies. So one of the things that uh, uh, is, is very interesting to me is when we did the Air Ghana march and the police union said, how could the UFT support us? Because the teachers are the ones in the schools having to explain to these kids why they're subjected to this. We act like union members are not regular people that get stopped and searched and harassed as well. So I think that the way we educate, that unions can educate is first educate their members on their own rights and how they are interconnected with the rest of the city and how as an organized body, they have an infrastructure that can help protect their colleagues in their community. And that's why you join unions, is to protect the interests of union members. And I think that that kind of education, that kind of process is what we've got to get back to. We're not just, we don't just have unions that just deal with wages or just deal with those kinds of uh, negotiations, but also for the good of their members. If you have a social policy that is discriminatory, your members are gonna be impacted by that. So we can fight for the whole, which is also fighting for us specifically, because you cannot save the specific without changing the whole. I think we're going to have to conclude now. I draw from this uh, discussion that we've had this morning that yes, there are still a lot of problems out there, but at the same time we've made some progress if you take a very long view and as the Reverend says, we're at a moment where we might really be able to achieve some, some very important concrete positive steps towards dealing in, with this in a way that maybe we weren't able to in the past. So I think we should all walk out of the room thinking about what can we do to make these steps actually happen and to, to make them effective. So let's thank the Reverend for leading us this morning. <laughs>